Now, getting finance for your home and getting a good deal on it can be difficult. And this is precisely what we are trying to simplify today on Property Hotline. Welcome to the show. I'm Kavita Krishnan. And with me in the studio is Karthik Javeri. Karthik is the director of Transcend Consulting India Private Limited, a market expert. And he will help you with answers to all your home finance queries related to, that you want to ask when you are planning to buy real estate. Karthik, welcome to the show. Thank you, Kavita. Uh, we've got uh, Rakesh's uh, question. Let's start off with that. He says, in order to avail a home loan and its benefits, should I buy a ready-to-move-in property or property where position is expected by next year? And I'm assuming when he says benefits, he means tax benefits. Of course, it's tax season. But should you really be buying real estate or buying a home just for the tax benefit? Absolutely, 110%. I mean, should you really do that? That's the fundamental question. But before we do that, let's answer this question. So if you have a choice between a ready-to-move-in property and a property where you're going to get the possession next year, naturally, no question, I mean, no doubts about it, definitely go ahead and buy the property which is ready to move in because as soon as you buy that property, your tax benefits will start immediately. You know, the possession which is one year hence could be delayed a little more and which is not something which is in your control. So your tax benefits may not really accrue. But then coming back to the moot question, why would you want to buy a property just because of tax benefits. An investment, whether it's a property investment or any other investment, should fundamentally be made on the merit of the investment. So is the investment so good? Is the investment going to create wealth for you? Is the investment credible enough, which is worth your money? Because you see, think about it, do the mathematics. You're going to spend a lot of time, you know, servicing the loan. You're going to pay interest on that. You have to pay property tax. You're going to pay maintenance. You will have to keep uh, paying for updates and repairs and upkeep and all of that. It's not going to be so easy. You know, property having is like a white elephant. So you really need it, buy it. If it's a good investment property and if it's going to create some return for you then do it remember the rental yields are not more than about two or three percent in the large metro cities even in the uh, tier one and tier two cities the yields could be a little more maybe three to four percent but it is not astronomical and this asset is not going to grow at the rate of 18 20 25 percent CAGR so you need to really think about it whether you really want it we should not just rush in purely because there is a tax angle to it and therefore rush in to make any investment be it property or anything else Right, and having said that, real estate, if you invest at the right time, if you do enter into that uh, asset at the right time, can turn out to be a very, very good investment. Though you need to remember that it is a long-term play. It is not something that you buy today and sell within a year. In that case, uh, chances are that you will not get too much of a return over there. But if you hold it for enough time, history has shown that uh, you will get a decent appreciation on the investment that you've made. So you need to really figure out whether, uh, why, why is it that you really want to buy real estate and tax deduction is, is really not the reason why you should be investing in real estate. Moving on to Gaurav's question. He says, I want to know my civil score before applying for a loan. How can I access it? I've inquired with some banks, but they're saying I must apply for a loan and pay the processing fees first. I've never taken a loan before. So here's somebody who wants to be prepared before he goes to the bank. And the bank is saying, no, no, take the loan. Yeah, so, you know, Gaurav uh, needs to know a little bit of the process of how a loan is uh, to be taken and what the bank does in order to give him this loan. <coughs> Excuse me. What happens really here, Gaurav, is that once you apply for a loan, once you pay the processing fee, that means the bank knows for sure that you are seriously interested. You're not just making an inquiry, number one. Second, when they start processing your loan, before they actually sanction the loan to you, they want to know if you are good with money, if you have good financial discipline. And the best way in current uh, scenario is to find out your Sybil score. So then they will go and investigate on that Sybil score of yours. They will take the score, they will make their observations and they will then decide whether to give you that loan or not. But in any case, they will not share with you what your score is. But you don't need to worry about it. Sybil score for you and for all the viewers that are watching is a very, very simple procedure. You could simply log on to Sybil's website directly Pay a small fee to Sybil. It's a very, very small fee. It's less than 500 rupees. So you could actually go there, pay that little fee, and within about 24 hours to 36 hours, I'm, uh, I'm given to understand that you will have your Sybil uh, reports. I had pulled out some, uh, some of my own Sybil reports many years ago, but it's really quick. It's very convenient. You put in your name, your basic details, your PAN number, mobile number, email, 
and you pay the money, the report comes to you. It's completely online, completely hassle-free, and it's very, very detailed. You'll be surprised. You may have forgotten the loans that you took, or you may have forgotten the relationships that you had, and it will give you a complete analysis of everything. Even if you slipped away somewhere for five days or ten days, you'll know exactly what your civil position is. You'll know what the score is, why the score is what it is. Uh, it's a beautiful report, and I think you should do it. Even from a statutory compliance point of view, and for a general, uh, you know, being cautious point of view, every year we have on this show suggested to you in the past also that do it a yearly process take your civil score you know there are lots of frauds also happening incidentally and these frauds are being done by unscrupulous elements of our society and banks are not going to help you and nor are financial institutions helping you and civil is the worst of the lot they will just raise their hands and you are the one who's going to have an identity crisis and identity theft and all those kind of problems so these things happen so what you're saying is like you get check your, your health checkup done you every need year. to like you get your health checkup done Absolutely. you need to get your check civil your score also and also, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, I don't know if you've tried it, uh, Karthik, but uh, we are supposed to be getting one Sybil uh, report, one report from Sybil free of cost every year, right? Yes, that's right. There has been, um, you know, talk about this. At the same time, if you really go to the Sybil uh, website, I was reading a blog somewhere and I was told that you can't really find that link. That link is very, very deep down. It is hidden somewhere. Of course, they want you to pay for it and get the report, but that link does exist. I have not investigated myself, but I'm given to understand on a blog that it's available, but it's really deep down. You have to spend a lot of time to come to that link, even in their website. So, yes, so there you go. You are entitled to a free Sybil score Absolutely. as well. You do not need to pay money for that. True. And you'll, but you'll have to hunt for it on the Sybil website. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Parekh writes in and says, I've already taken a home loan and I'm availing income tax returns for that. I now want to take another home loan for another house. Can I avail income tax returns for that as well? In fact, the law on that has changed. I know, I know. It's unfortunate the law has changed. It was a lovely uh, little provision that we had wherein, uh, yes, you could buy your second property and then you could choose between those two properties which one would you call as your self-occupied property and which one would you call as the let out, uh, deemed let out property or if you actually let it out, then it's your let out property. But then you had the choice and then in the property which was deemed let out, normally people would put that property as the one which was, uh, you know, with a higher loan and higher interest uh, payments that you were making. And that entire interest payment there, you, you could get an offset from your income. You could offset against other heads of income, which was a fantastic improvision, but they've plugged it in, unfortunately. So going forward, the deduction on that is also the same deduction that you get if you had your self-occupied property, which is the 2 lakh limit. So we can't go beyond 2 lakh limit. So the answer to your question, Mr. Parikh, is yes, you will get that benefit. However, the benefit is now capped at 2 lakh rupees. So whether you decide to call your existing property as your self-occupied property or you take the new one and you call that to be your SOP, it doesn't matter. The deduction is identical in both the scenarios. Now, of course, that's going to be in force from this financial year and going forward. And in fact, that should also answer uh, Rakesh, if I'm not mistaken, Rakesh's question that we began the show yes. with, uh, where he asked us uh, what should he be investing in for uh, better tax returns. Now, this is how the tax laws have changed. And uh, with uh, GST coming in, uh, it could go in for another change, can't it? Yes, you know, see, that's true, absolutely. Now, whether it is, uh, you know, buying a house and there are taxes related to the housing file or deductions which are there and which tend to go away, which get modified. Uh, if you talk about stocks, mutual funds, there are capital gains rules that change. So you see, taxes and rules change. The basic mantra of making any investment is look at the merit of the investment. Which is that investment which can give you the highest rate of return, the highest return on your investment, on your hard-earned money? And then you make the decision to invest there. Tax will play its own course. You can't save taxes. You can try and you know, do your best to avoid it in the, within the you know, four corners of the law. You can try and do the, the best that you can. Take all advantages that you have, which the law provides to you but there is no way you can escape it. So do not make a decision on that because you may make a decision today and you might just find out that in three years time that the entire law advantage or the tax advantage has disappeared. What would you do then? You'll be saddled with something and you'll have to still service it because it's a big liability. Buying a home or buying a property is like, uh, it's not a simple decision. It's a decision which entangles many years of your life together. Right, and if you have any questions related to where you should be investing your money in real estate, you can send in questions uh, for those as well. We do answer those every Monday and Friday on Property Hotline. But moving on, uh, Prakash says that he's a government employee. His in-hand salary 
is 85,000 rupees per month and he's planning to invest in a plot of land in Bengaluru. Now he says if I take loan from a bank to purchase, finance my purchase, I'm sorry, am I eligible for tax exemption on interest paid to the bank? Should I buy a flat or plot? What is better? I have a budget of 90 lakh rupees. Hmm. Okay, so uh, this is quite clear. You see, I mean, you have given us two, three of your choices. So firstly, the choice is whether you should buy a land or whether you should buy a flat. Now, that answer you have to give yourself. What is it that is of interest to you and why are you buying the land? Normally, people buy land because they want to either construct something on it and they see some opportunity and they want to become a small little developer in their own right and then try and make a slightly longish kind of a profit out of the whole project that they are undertaking. So that could be one possibility. Sometimes you just buy land as an investment and then you want to sell it. So you need to decide which is the emotional decision you want to take first. Talking about tax uh, exemptions, now exemptions are available for a flat and not for land. However, if you want a loan to purchase it, you can get a loan to purchase both. So for your land also, if you want a loan, there's no problem. There will be a banker who will be ready to finance you uh, to get your <coughs> land. There, there are uh, NBFCs and housing finance companies who give you such uh, finance, but not necessary that you will get exemptions also. So you need to be very clear there. But again, going back to the flavor of today's show, we are talking about the same moot question again and again, that really speaking, should you look at tax benefit only as the deciding factor for buying your property or making any real estate investment? The answer is a resounding no. I think that's really very, very clear. Right. And moving on from there, we have Shiva's question and he says that he has a home loan from a reputed banker. I took the loan at a floating rate of 10.25%. The rate has now come down, but my interest rate is not coming down. Is there any provision to bring down the interest rate? He doesn't tell us when he took this loan. Exactly. Uh, so we don't know whether he's on the MCLR or the base rate. But this is something that we've been discussing non-stop on yeah. uh, Mirror Now. Yeah, yeah. So, so again, there are some standard uh, rules and procedures to follow. Uh, so Shiva, for you and for all the other viewers who may be having a similar sort of a concern at the moment, so the first thing to do is look at your sanction letter. The letter that you got from the institution when your loan was about to be disbursed or just before disbursement. So had, they had the rules written there. Whether you are in the new MCLR system, which obviously happened from April 2016, but before that, if you've taken your loan, most likely you've been on the base rate system. Either ways, the sanction letter very clearly specifies how your loan is going to operate. So they would say that this is the base rate or this is the basic rate. And on top of that, we would level, levy this extra rate. And that's the final rate that you will be paying. Now the base rate or the, you know, the base standard rate would fluctuate over a period of time. And because it fluctuates, you will be charged a little more over and above that. Now, you know that the market is actually offering rates which are almost 1.5% lower to your rate. So what should you do? You should go to the bank and request them to make a revision. They will obviously say no. You make an offer, you make a proposal to pay some fee to change that. And a lot of times banks are upfront and they tell you, okay, so you pay this little conversion charge and change your loan, go to the lower step and you can go to the better loan product. Now, if they don't agree to do that, then your last recourse is find out what's the outstanding balance. And like we always say, you're not married to that bank or that institution forever. So in your home loan tenure of 15 or 20 years, even if you changed your bank four times, it's perfectly okay. The banks will internally take care of your papers and your processes. All you have to do is go to the front desk and make a new application and try and shift your loan. Once you shift your loan, nobody wants to lose the business and they will most likely negotiate with you. And if they don't, then any Anyways, they don't need to have your business. You can take your business somewhere else. Right. Also, uh, you know, uh, since we brought up the issue of base rate and MCLR, could you tell him exactly what to do if he's on the base rate? And what should he do, be doing if he's on the MCLR linked loan? So, okay, let's talk about the MCLR because that's a more recent phenomenon. Now, most of the banks under the MCLR system are revising their rates anywhere from three months to one year. What that means is if your sanction letter says that Mr. So-and-so, your loan is linked to MCLR and we are going to refresh and revise this rate every uh, quarterly or half yearly, then that means whatever is the bank's rate, whatever they declare as their MCLR rate, you will be paying that half percent or one percent premium on that rate from that point of time onwards. So if it's a six monthly revision, as soon as your loan completes six months, whatever is the prevailing rate and the MCLR adjustment factor on that, you will be paying that. Going back to the base rates. No, but tell me this. Yeah. 
if I am on MCLR and yes. if I am on a six month cycle, yes. then will my interest rate automatically reset as in, I know that a lot of banks have reduced rates of na as, of, uh, That's right. as of late. That's and right. if I am on a higher rate and uh, say by the end of March is when my MCLR reset should happen. Correct. So will it automatically be reset or do I have to approach the bank? So the answer to that question is in your sanction letter itself. Take for example, you took your loan in January. Now your sanction letter said that this MCLR plus half percent premium will continue for the next one year and thereafter every quarter it will be refreshed then that's the rule that will follow. So then for that one year, you can't do too much, except that you can request no, the no, bank. What I'm asking is whether will the, bank, will the bank automatically reset it every quarter or yes. do I have to go and tell them that, you know, hey, you've reduced the rate, give me the benefit. Yes, Kavita. So automatically when you're, you're due for a revision, the bank would do it automatically. Okay. But a lot of times consumers have observed that this doesn't happen, which is why you need to be a little vigilant on your loan and go back to at least check your loan, see what rate of interest. You, and these days you have mobile apps. You can even find out what is your rate of loan going on. So you should inquire about it. You should not be completely oblivious to the fact that the bank will 100% be in compliance. I mean, we have seen that they are not in compliance and that is a very big, uh, you know, unfortunate situation that we are right, living in. Right, and what in. happens on base rate? If you're on base rate, you should uh, switch to MCLR immediately? So if you're on a base rate system, it's a good idea to switch to MCLR because the reason MCLR system was brought into the play in the first place was that as soon as the banking system was going to reduce their rate, consumers were not getting that benefit and which is why the RBI felt that it was a better idea. So it is definitely a better system to go to. Base rates are normally revised on a yearly basis or longer, but MCLR revisions happen faster. So the new bank that you approach, first check what is the MCLR revising frequency. Go to the one who has a quarterly revising frequency and that way what happens is whenever the rate goes down, you are in the first person in the queue to get that benefit of the revision of the rate. Though it's not as rosy as it sounds, the MCLR yes. system is really not working the way it yes. was supposed to, which means old borrowers are still sitting on older, more expensive, they're still paying more, more, much more of an interest rate as compared to the newer borrower who's getting the benefit of the interest rates that have come down. But of course, that's a separate debate and that's a separate campaign that we are, uh, for, you know, that we are pushing on uh, Mirror now. But time now for a short break while Property Hotline does continue on the other side. So do stay tuned. Welcome back. We are answering all your home finance queries on Property Hotline. Karthik Javeri is in the studio. And let's take Satyan's question next. Now, uh, Karthik, he says that he's a government servant. His salary right. is 9 lakh rupees a year. He plans to buy a house which costs around 40 lakh rupees. How much amount of loan am I eligible for? Uh, very simple, uh, Satyan. What happens is... Uh, Look at your annual income, which is 9 lakhs, which you said, so that monthly income works out about 75,000 rupees. You divide that by half and that's the maximum EMI that most bankers and housing finance companies will let you pay. So assuming that you do not have any other loan and you do not have any other liabilities which are going to show up, that means the bank will approve about 35 to 40,000 rupees out of your monthly earnings as your EMI. You work backward, a rule of thumb is that you have to pay approximately a thousand rupees for one lakh of borrowed housing finance. Which means if you are going to be eligible to pay somewhere in the range of 35 to 40,000 as an EMI, work backwards and your loan would be somewhere in the range of 35 to 40 lakhs. We are of course making an assumption that the loan is at 9% for 20 years and things like that. So that's the ballpark figure that you need to work with. So if your budget is going to be 40 lakhs, please understand one thing, that 20% of that you will have to pull up anyways because the bank is in any case going to finance not more than 80%. So which means 8 lakhs plus the stamp duty money and all of that which is what you'll need to pay, you will have to generate that resource first and the balance can come from the housing finance company. So though that's the mathematics for you, but it's fairly straightforward for anyone to understand 1000 rupees per lakh and look at maximum 40 to 50% of your monthly take home and that would be a great way to figure out how much loan you are eligible for. Right, and Satin, of course, it goes without saying that it's not just a 20% uh, towards the cost of the home that you have to cough up. You also need to spend around 10% of the cost of the home. Uh, and this is a ballpark figure that I'm giving you, which will go as taxes yes. to the government. So you need to be prepared for that. You need, with this includes, of course, your stamp duty registration. If you're going through a broker, you will have to pay the broker as well. You'll have to pay a brokerage over there. So net-net, be prepared 
for at least another 35% of the cost of the house, which will go out of your own pocket. Keep that much money ready and then approach the bank and you will see that you'll probably uh, be able to uh, buy that home. Moving on, we have uh, Kumar who says that his wife and he are both government employees. They've taken a joint loan. Now, while applying for IT exemption, only Kumar applied. Now, he wants to know if both of them can apply for exemption. If yes, in what proportion? So, obviously, you are applying for exemption midway. Now, let's understand one thing. When you've taken the loan, your transaction with the housing finance company is done with. When you are filing your income tax return, your association and relationship is with the income tax department and you have to comply with the income tax laws. Now, given the fact that you all have taken a joint loan, I am going to make a little extra assumption here that both of you are also co-owners of the property. I mean, it has to be logical. You can't be borrowing money if you're not the owner of the property. Uh, so now most agreements when they are made and if they are made with two people buying a property together, Normally, most people don't write that I'm going to have 33% and the other person is going to have 67% share in this property. They just write that A and B are buying the property together. Now, when you say that two people are buying the property together, it is understood, therefore, in law that each one of you have 50% ownership rights to that property, which means work backwards and you, when you file your income tax exemptions and income tax returns, right. both of you can take equal benefits. If your agreement, however, has a very clear cut definition, let's say sometimes there are three people or four people mm -hmm. also. And if there is a distinct di uh, division of who owns how much, then the income tax exemption would be also in the same proportion. But otherwise, in the absence of that... So even midway same, through the loan, you can, uh, both husband and wife can uh, turn around and claim exemption to the home. Yes, that's obviously. possible. And there are many scenarios in which this can happen. Right. Uh, you could have a scenario where one uh, spouse was not working at that mm -hmm. point of time when that loan was taken but was a co-owner and a co-applicant to the loan, then the person started working, right. so suddenly you have income, or maybe the income has gone up over a period of time, right. so lots of scenarios. Net, right. So net net, your answer is that if both of you are co-owners to the home, that is both of your names, figure on the agreement document, then both of you can uh, avail IT exemption on that home loan. With that, we come to an end of this episode of Property Hotline. Karthik, thank you very much for My coming pleasure. in and answering those questions. And of course, any question on real estate, send them in and we will make sure your questions are answered. Thank you for watching.